Thank you for joining us for the final panel of Arab Health. Um, today is a, a very special panel that we will be talking about startups in healthcare and the ecosystem in the UAE. I have uh, three distinguished uh, speakers here with me. Uh, Dr. Osama Abu Khair, the CEO of Taki Health. Uh, Taki Health is a digital health startup based in N5. And my colleague Saeed Nofali, Director of N5. N5 is an enabling a platform for tech, media, and design. And last but not least, Reza Kazimipur, who is the Mag Managing Director of Black Labs Dubai. I think I'd like to first start maybe uh, with you, Reza, telling us a little bit about what Black Labs is and what is the, the vision for it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me here as well. Um, Black Lab Dubai is a testing platform that enables the human yeah. potential. And what that really means is we take all the essential um, markers from your body, from your genetics, your microbiome, your blood, and even a psychoanalysis. And we have an algorithm that we've created from about four decades of research from universities and institutions that gives you your potential as a human being to show you whether you have the potential of being possibly a runner or a cyclist, or maybe you have the ability to see things better, hear things better, leveraging AR, VR technology, and bringing in professionals from each one of those disciplines that can help you enable that. And it's more of a lifestyle that you create rather than come with us and lose four or five pounds. But for us, it's a matter of learning more about the human being and how we can take that data and share it with the medical community for diseases and, and whatnot. But that's it in a nutshell. Excellent, very good. Saeed, the startup community is, is very, um, you know, what's the right word? Very exciting, to say the least. Uh, it has received a lot of attention. Uh, a lot of investment has gone into it. How do you see the coming few years moving forward? So uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation. And I think uh, uh, answering to your question, when it comes to startups, I think uh, the UAE ecosystem has evolved in the past, uh, I would say, 10 years, you know, uh, starting up with, you know, universities and so on. And then we now we started to see a lot of mature startups that are coming in and al also a lot of people who are coming in from working professionals who are turning to become startups because they see this opportunity. So as we grow, you know, a lot of investors are coming in. Uh, we are becoming mature. So even when it comes to training, uh, six, seven years ago, we used to train simple, basic business. But now the, the people who are coming in, they are actually educated. Uh, they are top like directors and, you know, mid uh, career management are coming in to become startups. So. I see it uh, with the support of the government, Alhamdulillah, it's, uh, uh, we are growing in a faster rate. And now, you know, we have a Minister uh, of State of uh, uh, Entrepreneurship and SME. We are going into developing this ecosystem now and also the policies. So, you know, startups always come first and they are the experiments and then the policies are following to, to kind of fix these challenges that they have. So I would say it's really exciting and a lot of good stuff are coming out of this ecosystem. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Dr. Osama, obviously a lot happening in the healthcare startup scene as well, but what is the main driver of that? Why is it that we're seeing more and more startups in, in the healthcare space? Thank you really for having me, first of all. It's a pleasure. So uh, being from, uh, I would say, medical background, so it's, uh, I have seen this, um, I would say, transition uh, from uh, from the uh, healthcare, very solid, very rigid, very um, legal driven, I would say, medical practice uh, driven, to be like more of an ecosystem that drives the innovation, uh, especially after COVID-19, we have seen this shift very clearly. So there is a lot of uh, big data and uh, data analytics and AI uh, going around. Uh, the, uh, the amount of transactions that healthcare is generating is massive as well. So uh, that's a big opportunity actually for the uh, ecosystem to learn from and uh, to uh, drive more innovation, to serve uh, the population in a better way and uh, to even work on a preventive healthcare rather than just curative healthcare. So we don't want the patient to come to us. We want to prevent the diseases as well, which is massively driven by uh, population health 
and uh, the big data. I'm going to come back to you, have more questions, but uh, let's zoom out a little bit and maybe Reza with you coming from the US and California and spending your time between uh, Dubai and, and Silicon Valley. Obviously, we're still, you know, a few decades or maybe uh, 10 years or 20 years behind what's happening. Uh, but what are the things that you, that Dubai can learn from Silicon Valley? I think the key components with any country, whether it's Dubai or, or any country, is for entrepreneurs as they're going through these stages. And just to touch base with what Saheed had mentioned, one of the biggest challenges I see is with entrepreneurs coming in, they're super smart. They go through school, they come up with these ideas, but the two things I look for is where do you, how do you come up with that idea? Is it something you did as, at work? Or is it something you just created because there might be a market opportunity like, this is cool, I'll find some people, we'll do a startup. And that's the thing I don't want. I want to know exactly what you've done that you found was a niche area in that specific business line that became an opportunity in a bigger company that you're taking out and splitting off. So that's one. The second is, I teach a course at Stanford called Hustling 101. Again, these are PhD students, very smart, but the one thing they lack, which is unbelievable, is social skills. There is no way they can go out into this crowd and come up with two contacts. So I do this as a test. I make sure they go to a conference, I put them up on stage, because I said, if you don't do this, you end up hiring me as your CEO to come run your company. Is that what you want? Because I'll take half the company. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a big challenge with any entrepreneur is teaching them the basic social skills as a CEO, as a founder of that company. They should be driving everything about that company. They should be going out and doing everything from sales to the technology. So that's the two biggest challenges that I've seen. And here in Dubai, there's amazing a plethora of opportunities. And what I look for is how that differentiates between the U.S. and here, because there's certain different things, especially in the healthcare side from diseases, from prevention, from anything it might be that make me interested in coming back out here. Said, for those who don't know N5, what are the things that you provide for companies and startups? Yeah, we, so we, we try to come in uh, at the earliest stage of a startup, so we behave like an incubator that saying that we are here to support you from, from an idea to, to raising funds to Series A and so on. So the, the, the stuff that, you know, every country has their different sets, but for us, when we started with tech, it was about the business license and the visas and, and so on, and the co-working space and stuff. And we provided that. And then we moved to the next level was that we found out that the startups or the businesses need education. So we went into bringing, uh, you know, these workshops and developing these workshops and making theme based in order to, to support these startups. And the thing is about, the startup world is um, a 20 year old, 20 um, years, someone who works for 20 years or 15 years in a corporate thinks that he can build a startup. He might have the experience of the corporate, but he is, there is a different mindset when it comes to starting a company, right? You can't go in that way. So what we do is we unify all these learnings. So the student, the stay home mom, the whatever, whoever comes in, we unify the education and then we start connecting them to mentors. So one challenge that I had uh, when I was starting a company is I was good technically, but I didn't have the right mentors. And this is why we brought in the mentorship uh, uh, aspect to support the startup, because instead of me going around for five years trying to figure out what's going on and to go into the market, this person can cut it short and I can launch my business within six months. Right. So because you have these expertise and so on. So we continue to develop this. We're not that traditional place who just gives you a license and so on. No, we're now going on the ground to provide more value to the startups. So we connect them to investors. We enable business opportunities within our uh, Dubai holding and, and, and UAE as well. So we're trying to give startups as much as possible. And now we're also trying to open the talent uh, by speaking to different universities. So we kind of that hub that tries to provide startups with so much value so they can come in and leave and say that, okay, this uh, entity has given us all this. So we can, so I would say our promise is to supply the industry with quality startups. Excellent, very good. Uh, Dr. Osama, going back to healthcare specifically, now there is so many things happening and I think uh, with COVID we've learned a lot of things. Uh, you know, we've learned how 
how much prevention is important, how much you know, uh, good diagnostics is important, you know, really managing healthcare because, you know, it's very expensive. Um, and, and, you know, there is the, the government side and then you have the private players as well. So what, what can startups do for these big entities, you know, the likes of Saha, DHA, uh, MediClinic, for example? Sure. So, um, just to st streamline, you know, their businesses and making sure that they, they, they operate with, uh, with not this huge overhead that they have. Sure. So I think one key distinction, I came from a corporate background, just to reflect on Said. So uh, yeah, I used to work with Ernst & Young, I used to work with IQVIA before. So I've been blessed to also consult, maybe come a couple of these ones, uh, including DHA, for example. Uh, so coming from this corporate background to the startup. Startup is all about, I would say, innovating, uh, and keep innovating, keep driving this trial and error mix, which as a government you cannot do. So you are uh, tied up in the government with uh, budget. Uh, you don't have the flexibility to go to probably venture capital who are more, you know, more agile in their approach. They want to see innovation. They don't go traditionally, for example. Um, and also the, the right mix actually for the healthcare is to have both arms going hand in hand some, some, somehow. So you have those uh, big corporate who are, uh, I would say, or big institutions, not corporate. They are big institution, healthcare institution, DHCC, DHA, uh, Mubadala, for example, healthcare, and so many. So uh, those institutions are having the right amount of resources. Plus, they want to build partnership with startups like us. So they bring the innovation uh, to the clinical setting uh, within, I would say, sandbox. So you can play around within the sandbox quite uh, in, a, in a small experiment and then learn and then adopt in the organization itself. So this model, uh, we have seen it in Dubai actually for some time, especially maybe in the FinTech. I think health tech need to go to this direction as well. And uh, that will add massive value, actually, to the uh, healthcare system in the region, uh, UAE and the region and beyond as well. Yeah, yeah. S since you have the mic, I want to get into funding a little bit because a lot of people that I meet, you know, their number one issue seems to be I don't have funding. So what's your perspective? So I can feel the bait because we're just uh, closing our seed round. Um, what, what, one, one key thing that uh, I have seen in the VC environment and the region is their focus on, um, I would say, I don't want to say it's a, but I would say it's a traditional tech and e-commerce kind of thing. When it talks about a deeper tech or more very specific tech, it's very hard to find uh, people who understand this in, uh, in quite uh, well. Uh, so, uh, um, however, those, I, I think the COVID-19 has changed the mindset to a great extent, which was in favor for us as a startup. <laughs> so a lot of them, they saw the, the traction that's happening uh, within the healthcare. Uh, a lot of uh, VC, traditional VC, who never did healthcare before, they did that for the first time. For example, we have one of these VC actually, uh, who we, we were their first transaction in healthcare ever. And uh, I think part of that is, yes, we're doing something amazing, but also they believe that uh, healthcare is now part of the new norm after COVID-19. Right, okay. Now, Saeed, we've seen, uh, you know, a lot of money going into e-commerce. Now, what's the next wave? Is it healthcare? Yeah, so I would say uh, I agree um, that, that at in an early stage of, of the ecosystem, and especially in this region, uh, e-commerce was a quick, um, it was a quick and uh, something that they could see uh, because we have uh, the scientific guys who are sitting in the labs, sitting on billion dollar opportunities, but they are not business oriented. So here, um, for me personally, I see the healthcare because we have a lot of researchers and the government have, you know, 
uh, uh, done a lot of research, like they, they invested in research, but they didn't invest. Well, they, they depend on VCs and so on to come and pick these guys up. So I believe that the education aspect um, uh, to the people who are sitting in the labs and building, you know, researching to, be, to come out, right? Like, uh, like what you said. And um, e-commerce was early stage. As like the startups, they started to mature, the investors also started to mature. We have to remember that also investors from this region are still being educated and learning from the experiences of um, e-commerce and so on. So now they're moving to the next step. What's new? Uh, because I've, I've spoke to one of the investors. He says, no, I don't want e-commerce anymore, right? I'm interested to invest in other, um, uh, yeah. And, and then we had an experience that there was a lot of uh, scientific, uh, science uh, startups that are trying to raise funds. What I advise is go outside to the people who understand, right? So the U.S. market is big and there are specific, because there are specific groups. There is people who are investing in e-commerce. There is people who are investing in deep tech. When I was raising funds for my hardware startup, all the investors in Jitex said, we don't invest in, in hardware because they're not comfortable, right? Yeah. So honestly speaking, I think if, if there is something big to come out of this region right now, it will be from the health, health tech, uh, health and, 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 and science. Uh, because now they've matured, they know how to invest and so on. They're just going to be mature and mature. Yeah, excellent. Reza, what's your uh, point of view on, on uh, mon you know, raising funds and, and the situation here? There's, there's a lot of money in this region. There's good money and there's bad money. What that means is when you're presenting your company, make sure you present it to someone that understands what it is you're talking about. Because as an investor, I only speak to companies that I understand in healthcare. If I don't understand something you're pitching me, I'm going to ask you the wrong questions. And those wrong questions are going to throw you off on a tangent. So instead of getting excited about what you're talking about, you're going to be defending everything you're doing while I'm playing with my iPhone. So unless you're I'm extremely desperate to get money and you're expecting money from a VC that doesn't understand what you're doing, they won't be helpful in your growth. They might be able to write you a check, but they'll just be someone silent. So make sure you do some homework and go out there and find people that have done at least something similar to what it is you're pitching so they can ask you those right questions. That's really my biggest advice when you're out there raising money. Excellent, very good. Do we have any questions from the audience? Just a question actually on that funding and the concept of having investment that really supports your growth and goes beyond um, pure monetary reasons. Are you seeing changes in region uh, around the structure of that? Moving not just from a VC perspective, but in terms of family offices from an investment point of view or corporate venture capitalism. Are you seeing much of that coming through? Absolutely. So as a VC, I raise 90% of my funds come from family offices. As a, as a company, as an entrepreneur, again, it's the same thing. Which family offices, especially in this region, there's a lot of family offices. Each one has specific portfolios from their family office that they invest in. So if you have something interesting that you can present them and getting, getting past that doorway to meet with them is, is a pain in the ass. It's very, very difficult. So typically there's a middleman. That middleman is the gateway for you to meet with them. And that's the one you should be looking for as an entrepreneur to see who has those connections. But again, it's how beneficial is your technology, your product or service for them as a family and their businesses. So again, it's no matter who it is, whether it's an institution, a strategic that you're selling into or a family office, see what the gift to get is. What's the benefit of what you're doing benefit for them? And just to add to the point, I think um, um, previously, when the startups used to come in, uh, a lot of family businesses around this region were not interested to invest in startups. But currently, when they saw the likes of Souq and uh, uh, Karim uh, exiting, they saw that the so now they're having that FOMO effect, right? Mm -hmm. Now you see a lot of family offices are coming in and uh, trying to open venture studios in order to 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 invest in startups and take them. You know, so so currently you will see a big wave, especially from this region, because people are same thing going back to the same topic is they're being educated. They are seeing the opportunity. And of the day, if you're an investor, either you invest or you miss the opportunity. I want to comment on that as well. So, uh, yes, we, we, we saw this shift actually in the mindset in the family business specifically. 
So uh, we were talking to one of the family officers out of the kingdom, Saudi Arabia, and uh, we, we started talking to them very early. You know, it takes months to close something now, especially after COVID, where there is no, there's no flights usually. So uh, a lot of that is happening on Zoom. But the uh, we saw this shift actually. So the the impact of of uh, the uh, pandemic has changed their mind. And they, uh, though that they started with like, uh, we don't understand healthcare, we do oil and oil, e-commerce, stuff like that. So they became now more interested into the uh, healthcare. Uh, yeah, we're starting maybe with the telehealth, but we are getting there to the deeper tech kind of, of, uh, of transformation within the sector. So yeah, we saw this transformation in the mindset actually. Right. Uh, Dr. Sami, just since you have the mic, I want to talk to you about uh, challenges that uh, are specific to healthcare startups. What are your challenges today? Is it data? Is it getting to the right people, uh, right providers? Is it regulatory? Yeah. So I, I would say, honestly, in UAE, we're very blessed with, uh, I would say, very agile regulators, to be honest. So they, they understand AI very well. Uh, they are understand when you say, yes, it's a decision by AI, not by human. So that was very clear, for example, in DHX, they have done that. Uh, Ministry of Health, they have done that. And definitely SEH as well, they have done that. So, and, and though that maybe, as I said, uh, adopting more regulatory uh, sandbox, which is driven by, I think, the FinTech has started this with the banks, again, heavily regulated industry as well. So uh, I think that's one of the key uh, area that can be uh, driven or improved as well. The second is definitely, yes, I think the, <laughs> the fund and the understanding, maybe Said has mentioned that, that there is an understanding happening now. I think the ecosystem players like Infar, Dubai Science Park and, and uh, you guys, for example, have uh, we have been for in five for, for two years now. So yes, they have been very supportive for us. Uh, they incentivize us, for example, after COVID-19, um, connecting us with uh, a lot of players and ecosystems. But also from, I would say, the, uh, the, uh, the science R&D hubs need to be more vocal, actually, for the uh, money, which is, we're not lacking of money in the region. It's about the mindset. So changing this mindset to be like there will be something and this wave is very big you need to catch it now so the e-commerce is 20 years ago now let's talk about something else right right um Saeed, i know that there is a lot happening on the corporate side um, and a lot of the big corporates are encouraging startups and, and ideas to you know come out from that and then you have some coming from the universities and there is a big push from there as well. But I've also seen a lot of startups that are coming internationally from different markets. Are we, are we ready to welcome uh, that kind of you know, people who have no idea how to navigate and, and they need a lot of handholding? I think most, a lot of N5 startups are actually coming from internationally and they join us. And, and, and this is why we, we try to as much as possible uh, to try and connect these startups with different businesses when, when the opportunity arises, right? So investment is one thing, but of course, in order for you to survive, you need more opportunities. But, you know, the, I think uh, UAE as a whole, there is so many opportunities in uh, different cities and they all provide different value. So in five is that we're supporting them and looking at, you know, the first was the infrastructure to support them to settle down and everything. And then now we're moving into going um, uh, and supporting them with different. The thing is, is that we have a, a big number of startups currently, yeah. but as much as possible, um, a lot of businesses come and knock our doors and say that, oh, do you have startups in the AI sector? Do you have startups in the uh, healthcare? Do you have startups in um, um, e-commerce? So we try and, and open these doors and support these startups as well. So yeah, so I think Dubai has set itself as a business hub itself, and it's easy to navigate because the government is also um, supporting with all these initiatives. And like um, Dr. Osama said that um, um, 
what we're doing right now is people are learning and after COVID, um, healthcare has opened a lot of people's eyes for us to actually go in deep into that. So data, uh, uh, you know, the data and getting all this information to serve. So we did, we did uh, a small um, um, competition when it comes to, to actually encourage uh, people with ideas because sometimes uh, people have ideas or and it was the right time during the pandemic uh, to to implement these and of course some of them actually started companies so there is a lot of uh, opportunities and especially people who are coming from outside and it's it's out there so hopefully I think I think the sandbox uh, concept um, uh, bringing it in for healthcare I have not seen it yet but it will be a great opportunity for us to kind of start something like this because it's regulated when it comes to data and accessing data and so on. So it's really important for us to kind of enable that so people can come and hopefully we can start something, maybe us, why not? Sure, sure. Reza, we, the, the UAE lacks um, specialized VCs. So there are a couple of very general VCs, maybe a few are special, but we don't have many or even a few that are, let's say, specialized in healthcare or even in science. So what would it take for the UAE to be able to attract those kind of companies? I think we're about three to five years away from even creating kind of a Silicon Dubai, as I call it, right? To have proper VCs that have specific interests, whether it be healthcare, media and entertainment, FinTech, IoT, the thing that's lacking is you have, there's lots of money, there's lots of families, but taking those and bringing, whether it's Silicon Valley t talent or from around the world and establishing that here has been the disconnect. Because most people come here, they take money, and they, you know, originally my first word I learned is don't be a flyby. Don't come here to take money and take it back. So one of the things that I'm trying to do here is create that mentality, spe specifically in healthcare, and create a fund that enables entrepreneurs, whether they're expats, or Emiratis from the region and give back to them. So I think that's kind of the start, but we're still about three to five years away from that actually happening. But it's enticing people to come here with all the opportunities that you guys are offering to have incubators that can connect you with the right people and institutions to get funding and help you grow in that process. Chris, I have a question for you specifically. The, um, there's so much liquidity in the investment community that we find we don't need as much money as benchmark. Um, so a couple of questions. One, what is the sweet spot right now for a minimum ask for funding? And also, can you speak a little bit about SVPs, the structure, value, um, the bundles that are out there? We're getting a lot of calls about that because we aren't looking for enough money. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you guys aren't familiar with SPVs, they're special purpose vehicles. I've done about seven of them this year. You create a uh, specific either technology or industry, and then you get investors to come in and invest into that SPV. It's unlike a typical venture fund, because a venture fund, there's different economics and there's regulations around that. A SPV, I can set up anything from 12 million to 100 million. I can get the four of us to put in you know, 20 million each, and we can invest it into one company or, or a plethora of companies. So it's a much easier process if you know someone that has the SPVs to invest in. That's the first one. The second one is there's no easy route to get money, right? It, it all goes back to what I said earlier is the investor that you're speaking to has the understanding and what level of comfort they have in investing, whether it's super early stage of the ideation or like myself, I'd like to see a product like even an MVP something that works that's one and the second is what i said earlier is what have you done to kind of prove yourself to be even doing this product or service or company so i want you to i want to see that fire in your eye how excited you are about doing this thing and the rest of it is you know the amount of money they have whether it's you're raising a hundred thousand dollars or a hundred million dollars that they're willing to give you and take that chance and risk in you i don't know if that answers your question there is already fire in michelle's eyes so <laughs> Can we maybe speak a little bit because I really like your experience, Michelle, and what you have done and, you know, really focusing on not massive things, but really small kind of investments and technologies that can have a big impact. But still, it hasn't really 
you know, taken off. So, yeah, so we have been building out an ecosystem and we uh, we're start with the VCs and capital in the States in particular, they like to compare us to a bad mine. And I don't need five hundred million dollars. I can be very efficient with ten million dollars. I I can even negotiate from from there if you want to come down. Um we have we have started down this SVP model, so we have brought in several partners. Um, we are now working with uh, several governments to represent them. So a company like in the United States who wants to be here, if their technology makes sense, we can add them to the, the ecosystem. Um, but it's it's convincing them that they don't, that I don't need that much money, and I am not interested in taking over that, giving up that much control for them to give me a slush fund. So right. that's really the struggle. And I also find that there's, we, as you said, we are three to five years from finding, at least for us, we have been in the kind of VCs here, but there is a lot of traction, as you know, in, in the U.S. And I would bet that our funding will come um, right now, we, we're getting funding from major multinational corporations who want to then be resellers of our ecosystem to sell their I think that's the best route to go. I don't think VCs might be the best people to be speaking to at this point. Strategics as a phase one to gain what you need. If you don't need $100 million, you're raising 3 to $5, 10000000 million, then go out to the strategics that can be your sp potential partners so you can sell to, sell through to them as well. Start with them once you've built that traction and you can clearly define your differentiation between you and anyone else in the, in the world out there, then that takes you to the next level to raise a bigger check. But like I said, you can take the entire year and speak to as many VCs as you want. Your answer is gonna, 90% of it is gonna be exactly the same because they see one company and they try to compare you to that one company. So that's gonna be your biggest hurdle so to overcome it is going to be here are the partnerships that we've established. This is the revenue that we've established that we're gaining. And here's how we'll overcome that. That's really the, the only answer I can give you on that. So in looking at the successful uh, companies that came out of uh, N5 and those who were able to have you know, a very large exits. I mean, I know they're all different, but was there commonality in, in something right that they have done? Yeah, I think um, um, this like you know different startups have different paths for us a lot of them um who raised large amount of funds actually are the experienced entrepreneurs right or they're really um are technical that they really know their stuff and they ha know how to combine it with business so we have for example tabby who raised uh over th during pandemic they raised more than thirty thousand uh, thirty million 30 million uh, uh, 30 million US dollars. Oh, wow. Right? So I think we have a, a Taibi, Taibi. They raised uh, around 100 million, I think. Okay. Yeah. So we, we do have a lot of mature startups. That's that's the positive side of of um, of um, N5, that we have the mature and we have the small ones, you know, the younger ones who are coming up and so on. But I think a lot of them are mature in terms of uh, their professionals or serial entrepreneurs. So um, uh, Tabby actually was ex Namshi CEO. And when he left and when they got bought by Amar, he left and he came to us and he st opened this startup, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. so we do have mature startups that are coming through. It's just that uh, when it comes to exit in this region, there are not many. So we have these small, small exit, but not as big as uh, yeah, so we have two companies who went IPO, uh, which is Desert Control, who is in the agriculture tech. Yeah. And we have uh, Angami. I think a lot of us yes. know Angami, the music platform. Yeah, so these are the two who came yeah. out. Yeah. They were acquired by Do, right? Or um, I don't think so. Okay. But they partnered with Do. They partnered with Do. Yeah, they partnered with Do, yeah. Yeah, yeah but now they ipo so yeah, say, say they started with us when we first started and then they went into to Dubai Internet City to establish, you know, to, to grow because they grew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So it, it looks like the uh, experience in those uh, sectors plays an important role. So 
and I know that you're doing a lot of mentorship program for the uh, younger startups. How is how is that working? Do you see the younger startups learning from the mentors, or is there a gap? Do you, do you need to maybe have uh, you know training institutes to to have more skills for for younger startups? Yeah, I think the the ecosystem itself. Um, we have younger startups coming through. We're trying to combine them and make the, the matured one uh, mentor these startups. And also some people from, from the uh, corporate world who are really experienced or subject matter experts to also mentor these startups as well. And on the other hand, we have the younger generation who are the students, right? And the talent. This is something that this, this region itself, it, like we are working to bring this talent up to be able to work for startups, right? Because startups need people who can action and, and deliver, right? Yeah. So they don't have time to sit there and you know re-educate again. So that's why we speak to universities to bring this um, um, these generations to come, yeah. But yeah, definitely the whole model of N5 is taking the mature startups who are housed in, at N5 to mentor the upcoming ones. And, and also we are uh, building this educational platform we call it the Inc. Five Academy, is to educate these startups as well. I think I think when it comes to knowledge, the information is out there. You just need to look for it. It's just that when they come to us, we say that if you want to reach this level, um, or you want to get investment, or you want to have sales, these are the this is the journey that you need to go through, because the rest of who passed you and raised investment or you know um, uh, were able to sell. They went through this journey, yeah. And you know, when you have three hundred startups, um, you it's it's replicated, and we can learn from this this group and and improve as we go. Doctor Osama, we're coming almost to the to the end of uh, this session. Do you have any closing remarks? I'm um, just uh, for non healthcare people. Uh, healthcare is honestly poised for disruption, and I would say that uh, there is a lot of. There are a lot of opportunities sitting there for uh, more agile, I would say, companies, more agile funds uh, who are can change that that behavior. Because the healthcare is like, um, I would say, it's one of the most rigorous um, industries, and uh, a lot of these, you know, systems that run hospitals are developed 30 years ago. So you would be really amazed how outdated, for example, the interface that the doctor see while they are um, solving one of the most critical life decision problems. And uh, those systems are uh, uh, not helping, I would say. I've been a doctor. I suffered a lot, actually, from like how outdated these things are. I go to, for example, I go to my app and it's, wow, that's amazing. And then I go to the <laughs> HIS and then, wow, wow. There was a time machine, actually, that you need to travel back to get to work on those systems. So there is a lot of opportunities. Yes, definitely telehealth is maybe the most obvious one now. But are there specific areas? I mean, is it prevention, diagnostics, AI? Honestly, across the, across the board. So uh, yes, within the, the, the interaction with the patient, yes, telehealth comes into play. Telemonitoring now is, is, is getting a uh, big big chunk of the of the of the interest actually because a lot of people are sitting in their home they don't want to go to the hospitals and uh, the the behavior has changed for some time it's a, it's it's a very deep change actually now uh, when when it comes for example to the healthcare sitting itself uh, i would say that there are a lot of things so for example tech health we work on healthcare systems and we are an enterprise healthcare ai and we work on top of the other systems usually to be like very specific in what we saw. And the, the region now, in general, uh, I would say, I can remember very well when His Highness Sheikh Mohammed was talking about that. The, yes, healthcare used to be like a part of the other uh, or ju just general industry. Now we believe that it's a critical part of the, of the, of the economy. Yeah. So the healthcare will drive even more economy. Uh, that means the government will invest more after the COVID-19 and uh, yeah, so it's, there are a lot of opportunities. 
And uh, yeah, I hope that uh, we see this uh, vibe actually going into the healthcare. Absolutely. I mean, I, I dream of an app that looks like a, a bank account that has all of my information, my kids' information, when is their next doctor appointment, what do we need to do to be healthy, all my blood results to be in there. You know, there's so much information and it's so much scattered between the payer, my doctor, my you know school kids and all of that and it needs to be on one platform and and you know that can and drive many a lot of things like any other ecosystem i think the the mindset of, of of trying something new i know like let's say fintech the R system that they're using are still from the 90s right because they're afraid to change and same thing with healthcare sector some some of them are that that you, like you said you go back <laughs> to the past but I think because um, they're afraid of change right I think uh, uh, DHA just transformed to uh, I forgot the name of their new system that is paperless so they moved everything going there the pharmaceutical if you go now to most uh, UAE pharmacy stores yeah. you'll see the machines so they replaced the pharmacists right instead of having 20 you have two so that we are transforming I think from our part in UAE, the um, the government is heading that way. So there is a drive. The government is pushing forward that. But you know, any other industry, I think, um, if you s start to think like like an innovator, you're gonna always bring new stuff. But if you think like a consumer, this is when you just wait uh, for the big companies to come and provide you with something that is proven. So this is why uh, when you go to different countries, you see Mercedes-Benz uh, or Audi are actually creating innovation centers to welcome new ideas, right? Instead of sitting there and saying, oh, I want to show this because it's cool, right? <laughs> so we need to transition now and say that, okay, we are driving innovation, but also we want to uh, build value because they're not doing you a favor, right? You are actually providing value, yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm optimistic and I think things are going in the right direction. For sure. Reza, closing remarks? What you explained, Marwan, exists right. in great forms all over the world. What doesn't exist as a great business opportunity for one of you to get a hold of is the interoperability of those applications between countries, between municipalities. Because when I come in from the US, my health app doesn't work here. The physicians here have no idea who I am. I have to go through the whole process again, showing my lab reports, who I've seen, what I'm allergic to. There is nothing out there today that allows that interoperability. So that's really the biggest piece. There are some amazing applications from Path to Stanford, where I live in Silicon Valley, that makes it simplistic. I can go on there, I can see where my kids, I can see the last COVID shot, the last vaccine, whatever my kids, wife, anyone has gone through, but I can't use any of that here. If something happens to me, I have to go through all my records that I've taken snapshots of. So that's really the biggest piece that's missing. The printout. My printout, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we don't want to even go there. But as a startup, you're With going, a stamp. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Going through the startup process, you know, my biggest thing, you know, to close out is understand your market. Be excited and just do your homework be be before you speak to any investor so that they understand who you are, what you do, and why you are so excited. Because you should have this smile on your face and that fire in your eye when you're out there speaking to them. And that's it. Perfect. Thank you very much. That's an uh, excellent closing. I want to thank all the panelists for your contribution and also the attendees. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.